how did a twisted method of execution wind up as a nation's flag? This is St Andrews. These days, as famous as the home of golf, for being the place where posh blokes come to trap themselves a wife and for offering up the irresistible temptation for middle-aged men to recreate the opening scene from Chariots of Fire. But there's a bit more to it than that. This is St Andrew, or a statue of him in St Peter's Basilica in Rome. Here he is with his skew with cross and my glamorous assistant, just for some scale. And here's a more stylized version of that cross, or saltire, on the national flag of Scotland. But why did this guy become our patron saint? Why the wonky cross? And why golf? That last one's probably too big a question for today. But welcome to Scotland Unplugged, and the story of Scotland's national flag. St Andrew was born around the year 5 AD. He was one of the core disciples, an OG, along with his brother St Peter, who was the first Pope, and clearly the overachiever in the family. After hanging up his fishing nets and parking up his boat, he spent most of his life travelling, preaching. He covered some ground. Georgia, Romania, Ukraine, Greece, all claim that he rocked up there to convert the locals at some point. He was eventually, as is inevitably the way in that line of work, martyred by the Romans in the city of Patras in Greece. The story goes that he didn't feel right about dying in the same way his boss did. Instead, he insisted on being crucified on a crux de casata, a diagonal cross. Although some historians say that's just how the Romans did it in Greece. I would apologise for my abysmal Latin pronunciation, by the way. But I realise there's probably no one alive who can actually correct me, unless there are any Roman ghosts creeping about. This is St Andrew's Cathedral, or what's left of it. It's named after the man himself, obviously. The Pictish king Hungus I is said to have founded a monastery here in the 8th century after St Regulus bought the apostle's relics, his bones here, in the year 345. Regulus was either a monk or the Bishop of Patras who half inched the bones, did a runner and wound up here. This is kind of the point where myth and legend overtake the documented history for a while, but it doesn't make the story any less relevant. One night in the year 345, our bone burgling bishop had a dream, and in that dream an angel told him the Emperor Constantine was coming to take St Andrew's relics to Constantinople. Constantinople was the capital of Byzantium, the Eastern Roman Empire. It was also the city that just happened to be named after the Emperor himself. The angel told our light-fingered protagonist to sail to the western edge of the known world, which in those days, in Roman terms, was the far-flung outpost known as Caledonia. He was either shipwrecked on the rocks here, or told to weigh anchor by the angel. I'll let you decide. I say he brought the bones here. That kind of implies he turned up with a full skeleton. It was really an upper arm bone, a kneecap, three fingers and a tooth. A kind of bony mishmash. The anatomical equivalent of a lucky dip bag. The story goes that shortly after Regulus sloshed ashore, he met Hungus the First. That is a bit strange, because Hungus probably lived in the 8th century, so there's a bit of a 400 year gap to wrestle with. The problem is, the Picts aren't known for their literary skills. They left us with some epic stonework, some very intricate jewellery, but the only real accounts we have of them come from either earlier Roman sources who describe them as naked, painted warriors that scared the bejesus out of them, or from ecclesiastical writers like the Venerable Bede, who chronicled the story of St Columba, but probably didn't get out much. Going on the descriptions, it's tempting to think of them as sort of angry, painted ginger hobbits, but they were a sophisticated society. There's even a suggestion they had water wheels. We just don't know anything about them. And eventually, their history merged with the Gales and the Vikings and everyone else. They don't call it the Dark Ages for nothing. This is St Rule's Tower. It dates back to the 11th century, 
stands 33 metres tall and overlooks the cathedral and the town. St Rule is just another name for St Regulus. I think if I was him I would have chosen something a bit more snappy like St Reggie, but that's me. The cathedral took a hundred years to build. It was completed in 1318. Unfortunately, like a lot of Scottish churches, it was attacked, stripped of its altars, and then abandoned during the Reformation in the 16th century. And then the locals used it as a quarry, which kind of explains why most of it's missing. Regulus is one story, but there's another, more simple version. It's more likely that St Acca, the Bishop of Hexham, brought the relics here in the year 732. Supposedly, he picked them up on his Roman tour. I mean, everyone loves a Roman tour. Just, most of us are happy with a fridge magnet at the Colosseum, and maybe some dodgy selfies from the Trevi Fountain. This is Athol Stanford in East Lothian. A hundred years after Hungus the First, we meet Hungus the Second. Sounds like the picks were about as inventive as my family are when it comes to naming the guys. Legend has it that the Picts were fighting the Northumbrians, led by the Saxon ruler Athelstan here in the year 832. Anyone else who's seen the TV series Vikings is probably picturing the monk with the same name right now. It's okay, me too, but no relation. Outnumbered, on the eve of the battle, Hungus was visited by St Andrew in a dream. The apostle told him that the cross of Christ would be carried before him by an angel and all would be well. During the battle, the Picts saw a white cross against the deep blue sky. The Saxons were defeated and Athelstan was skewered in the river here behind me. Hence the name, Athelstan Ford. Not too sure how he'd feel about that one. It's a good story. But even the very basic historical elements are a bit sketchy. Whatever might have been recorded on paper at the time, during the Wars of Independence in the late 13th and early 14th century, Edward the Longshanks, the King of England, very deliberately destroyed a lot of the written records. It was around the same time he took away the Stone of Destiny. If you want to subsume a country, taking away its history is a pretty good start. The earliest version we have recorded was by Walter Bower in the fantastically titled Scotty Chronicon in the 1400s. In that version, there's no mention of a cross in the sky. That emerged much later in written history. In fact, not for another 200 years. The flag itself was first recorded as having been raised in the year 1512. So why is St Andrew the patron saint of Scotland? I mean, we have a few of them to choose from. St Columba, St Ninian, St Mungo. But none of them are quite as heavyweight as Andrew. A man who actually hung out with Jesus. And that's kind of the point. A lot of it probably has to do with timing and the need for a heavyweight. During the Wars of Independence, in the year 1299, Pope Boniface VIII signed a papal bull in support of Scotland, condemning Edward's invasion. It has been suggested that a key part of the campaign to make him do that would have been St Andrew and the fact that we had his bones. St Andrew's had become the epicentre of the Scottish church by then and that made it distinct from the English or the Irish churches. Also, the cathedral was consecrated in the year 1318, only four years after the Battle of Bannockburn. Robert the Bruce would have been there and would likely have given thanks to St Andrew for his victory. In 1320, the Declaration of Our Broth asserted Scotland's independence and proclaimed St Andrew the patron saint. Whatever the documented history, we have to remember that the oral tradition would always have been around, passed down through the generations, becoming more fantastical with every telling. This was a world where angels did tell you to steal things, victories were handed out by saints and deities, and crosses could appear in the sky. I mean, they do today every St Andrew's Day when some nutter turns up with a plane, causing Instagram feeds to turn blue and white and every conspiracy theorist in the country to start ranting about chemtrails. But you get my point. The stories were real to the people who founded 
what would become this country. 